Our Father in heaven, dear Lord, at this time, I pray for the Holy Spirit to take over and to speak to each one of us. And Lord, may each one of us give our hearts to you and be ready for your coming. I pray in Jesus' most precious name. Amen. I want to welcome once again our visitors. You know, it's it's so nice to see new faces. And uh, um, you have been here before, right? Uh, thank you for coming. Keep visiting us. And uh, whenever you are here, please make sure this is your home. Uh, this morning I want you to open your Bibles and keep it open at Genesis chapter 21. Genesis chapter 21. You see, our impression of the Old Testament is that God was busy selecting a people of Israel as his chosen and special ones and rejecting everybody else. That's what our impression is. Cain, Cain's offering is accepted, Abel's is not. Lot's wife was turned into a pillar of salt just because she looked back at Sodom. Noah and his family are exclusively selected to survive the great flood. Israel was chosen, but not the other tribes of the world. Isaac was chosen, but not Ishmael. Friends, while God may have had a chosen people, God is also a God of outcasts. And in our story today, we will focus on Hagar, who is an Egyptian slave girl, who is brought into this drama of this story. The only reason that Hagar was, was put into this position was because Sarah and Abraham's faith wavered. You know, God had promised descendants, right, to Abraham, but none was forthcoming. At Sarah's suggestion, uh, they decide to take matters into their own hand. So Sarah sends Hagar, her handmaid, uh, in to lie, lie with Abraham and produce an offspring. Like most of our mistakes, it must have seemed like a very good idea at that time. But the consequences were bad. Finally, in their old age, God grants a child to Sarah and, uh, and the one she names Isaac, which means laughter. But things don't go too well. You know the story. I'm not going to repeat that story. But, uh, you know, uh, later on we find that uh, Sarah, uh, uh, she says to Abraham, cast this slave woman, cast the slave woman uh, with her son. The King James Version says, born woman. For the son of this slave woman, or born woman, shall not inherit along with my son Isaac. Chapter 21, verses 10. Sarah refers uh, to Ishmael and to Hagar only by their social status. Abraham loved both his sons. And he probably cared for, deeply for Hagar as well. But Abraham finally relents when God reassures Abraham that Ishmael too will be the father of a nation. So Hagar 
and Ishmael are sent forth to wander in the wilderness of Beersheba until their meager provisions are exhausted. In fact, this is not the first time. This is not the first time that Hagar wanders in the wilderness. In chapter 16, if you see chapter 16, pregnant, she flees from Sarah because uh, she's mistreated by Sarah. But then she returns back to Abraham and Sarah because uh, the angel told her to return. You see it in verse, verse 9. Now, friends, this is a very heart-wrenching story because it is our story. Yes, it's our story. We realize it's not just our ancestors. It's about the mixed family that so many of us experience now. First wife, second wife, surrogate parents, children, conflicts, your kid, my kid, our kids. Poor Hagar. She addresses Abraham, this, uh, her husband. She addresses him, the father of my children. Here we find the first single mother thrown out to survive on her own. It's a story of a boy who becomes alienated from her father. Yes. It's a painfully modern story. There is probably someone right here saying, I don't feel chosen. I feel rejected, lost, orphaned. I identify with this poor forsaken woman with her tears and her dying child. And we can also identify with the millions of women who are on the run from evil in instigated by injustice in places like Sudan, Syria, Somalia, women and children right now are experiencing the plight of a Hagar. But let me assure you that you are a child of God. And God demonstrates his divine care and mercy for those who are outside the special covenant relationship in two different ways. And you see that in this story of Hagar first. The water in her skin, water in her skin bag, was empty. I don't know if you have seen the skin bag. You have seen the skin bag? I, I have personally seen it. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a bag made with skin and with a spout on one end. You know, uh, water keeps cool. Yes, you fill water in that, it's cool. I have seen it personally and I've... So, the water in her skin bag was empty. And she cast the child under one of the shrubs, and she went and sat about a uh, bow, bow shot away, about 100, maybe 100 yards. For she said, let me not see the death of the child, the death of her future. God heard the voice of the child and, and the angel of God called to Hagar out, uh, out of heaven and said unto her, What aileth thee, Hagar? For God had heard the voice of the lad. Arise, lift up the lad and hold him in thine hand, for I will make him a great nation. That's number one. Second, second, God opened Hagar's eyes to see a well of water nearby. Just, just as Abraham, if you see in the next chapter, in the, just the next chapter, just as Abraham in the next chapter will see a ram caught in the thicket. 
And in both cases, the seeing led to new life for Abraham's sons. Ishmael grows up under divine protection, becomes an, an expert bowman, marries an Egyptian woman, has 12 children, and becomes the father of a great nation, just as God promised. Oh, friends, there was a well. Yes, there was a well close to Hagar all the while. God didn't bring, uh, uh, he, he just didn't make a, a well appear out of nowhere. That well was there. Hagar just didn't see it. Friends, this is how it is with us. Sometimes we, 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 our eyes are closed. We don't see things. There are sometimes, there are some experiences that happens to us that we don't understand. We, we, we question God, why? Why? But if God opened our spiritual eyes, we will understand. Yes, we will understand why. Our spiritual eyes need to be opened. We need to see. Sometimes when we read the Bible, we cannot understand. We, but, but when our spiritual eyes are open, we get to understand things. Let me give you an experience. It's an incident. You see, we used to have a, a, we used to have a, a person by the name of Dr. Dr. Lowry. Dr. R. S. Lowry was the president of the Southern Asia Division. You know, he was the president. And he told us an incident um, which happened to him. He was traveling in a train, you know, in India. Uh, they were going to, uh, he was going for some meetings and uh, he was traveling in this train and he booked his ticket. He got a reservation. Uh, uh, the, the, his seat was just next to the window. And he got this window seat. And he sat there, he arranged his things, and, uh, and then uh, all of a sudden, after some time, there was a man, a huge big man. He was a built man. And he came to uh, Dr. Lowry and he said, uh, uh, that's my seat. You need to get up from here. And Dr. Lowry said, but my, I have a ticket. This is my seat. And uh, the man said, no, you, you better leave. You go sit there. Go and sit in the other seat. And so uh, Dr. Lowry, he just didn't want to argue or have a fight. He said, OK. Uh, he got up and uh, went and sat in another seat. And uh, this huge, big, built man, he sat on this uh, window seat. And uh, uh, the train went for some distance. It, in fact, uh, it went uh, uh, for a long distance. And then uh, all of a sudden, the train, uh, it was going through an area where they had strike. It was an area where there was strike. And uh, outside, there was a huge crowd of people, and they were throwing rocks at the train. They were throwing rocks at the train. And then all of a sudden, there was one rock that came and struck this window where this man was sitting. And the window broke into pieces. The next rock that came, where came right through, and hit the man on his face, in his nose, and in a few minutes, the man was in blood. Dr. Lowry was telling, if I was there, that would have happened to me. Sometimes we don't see things. Why God is doing certain things to us, we don't understand. But if, we, if he would open our spiritual eyes, we will know. It 
it is needful that she should see the well the lord in great compassion led her to see it or as the, or as the text puts it god opened her eyes to his provision right in front of her our god does very great things when there is a need for them the same god who divided the red sea that made the jordan dry up <coughs> the same god who came with all his chariots of fire at uh, uh, param that is uh, second kings uh, chapter 6 you'll see the story in verses 8 to 23 and the same god who made the mount the mount sinai to smoke in his presence it is this very same god who opened hagar's eyes something sometimes very little things become absolutely necessary god by opening hagar's eyes secured the existence of the ishmaelite race which even exists right to this moment from that little kamath the great there are many here present who are thirsty for salvation why should you thirst thirsty souls wait any longer everything is ready right before us but our spiritual eyes needs to be opened Hagar's case is a strange one. Picture it. She is thirsty, and her boy is dying. Her instincts are quickened by her love for her child, and yet she cannot see the well of water. That is it. That is it. There it is. The well is there, close to her, but she cannot see it. till her eyes are opened now this is a very graphic representation of the position of many a seeking sinner there is the way of salvation and there is there is a, everything there is any plain it is so plain uh, in this world it is that road to uh, to life it's so simple believe believe in the lord jesus christ and thou shall be saved look unto the son of god and live what can be more simple and yet nobody ever did understand the doctrine that of of uh, believe and live till god opened the eyes the well is there but the thirsty cannot see it christ is there but the sinner cannot see him so some souls you know have such grief for sin such sorrow for having offended god such fear of wrath to come that they cannot perceive the truth which would comfort them what is that truth what aileth the poor soul what aileth the it is well that thou doest uh, uh, grieve for sin it is okay but christ has come to put it away it is well that thou uh, christ has come to save you and there there he is right just before you you only have to see him there are many who cannot see because of self conceit when our own good works or 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 uh, religious performances like scales covers the eyes of course he cannot see the way of salvation which is by christ alone the lord will take away these scales from our eyes for self is a great maker of darkness you know our eyes must be opened now not later on now 
at this very moment, if not recovered from our blindness, we will all die in our sins. How many times has this happened in our lives? You may have experienced it. We give up hope on something, but all of a sudden, we get an unexpected check in the mail or a phone call we receive that we desperately needed or a loving meal at just the right time. It would benefit, benefit us all uh, so greatly to remember always that Christ shows up for us the same way that he did for Hagar. Yes. Hagar had so many things going on against her. She was a slave. She was a foreigner. She was hated by a woman of power. Her son was, in fact, the patriarch's first son. But even by God's account, was, was not the son chosen to carry on God's covenant. She was an outsider in every way. And yet, God treats her with so much favor and kindness. So much, so much so that she gets the privilege, she gets the privilege of being the only person in the Bible who gets to name God. Yes, she's the only person who gets to name God. You see that in Genesis 16 and verses 13. Even though she is not even a Jew, Hagar gave us the term Elroy, Elroy, which means God who sees. Yes, we can all feel like the loser next to the popular kid at times. But this story reminds us that not only do we have a God who loves us in either situation, but a God who advocates for the outcasts and models for us to do the same. The Apostle Paul, the Apostle Paul uses this story of Hagar and Sarah uh, to teach us a spiritual truth concerning our salvation. You will see that in, uh, in Galatians uh, chapter 4. Galatians chapter 4. Uh, Hagar represents the old covenant based on the law that is given at Sinai and human works. Sarah represents the new covenant based on grace and the saving work of God. In Paul's analogy, believers in Christ are like the child born to Sarah. We are free products of the Spirit. Those who try to earn their salvation by their own works are like the child born of Hagar. They are slaves, products of the flesh. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we are not children of the slave woman, but of the free woman. Galatians 4.31 Paul counsels believers to get rid of the slave woman. Verse 30 that is, cease trying to earn salvation because the inheritance of the children of promise can never be shared with those who live under the dictates of the flesh. Mankind was created with spiritual eyes. That is how we were created. Adam and Eve was created, able to see, understand the deeper things of God. Unfortunately, it didn't take long for mankind to sin, sink into a pit of spiritual blindness because of sin and rebellion. You know, when Adam and Eve had perfect union, they had perfect union with the Lord. He had already opened the eyes of their heart to know him and fellowship with him. The day the serpent came and deceived Eve by, by claiming her eyes would be opened. And she would be like God, knowing good and evil. Genesis 1.4. Of course, 
it was a lie of all lies and the moment she ate of the tree her physical eyes were opened to her own sin and shame at the same time her spiritual eyes became darkened you know in numbers 22 numbers 22 in that whole chapter from 1 to 39 we read about balak you know invited balaam to come and curse the people of god of israel as god did not want balaam to go because he had blessed them an angel was sent to change the direction of balaam's donkey to prevent him from going balaam could not understand why the donkey was going in that direction because balaam was experiencing spiritual darkness spiritual blindness until god finally opened the spiritual eyes of balaam that he saw the angel that was directing the donkey to another direction this shows friends that no matter no matter how long we have been a believer no matter how much scripture we know no matter what our position and title is it is still possible for us to experience spiritual blindness john 9 verse 39 jesus says jesus says the blind see the seeing are blind to have the eyes of our hearts opened means that we understand the hope and assurance of our salvation it means that we are able uh, to partake in the greatness of god's immeasurable power by the working of the of his holy spirit in us ephesians 1 and verses 19 and 20 remember friends remember jesus takes the initiative by seeking those who are blind jesus takes the initiative jesus alone has a power to open blind eyes to move from from spiritual blindness to sight you must admit that you are blind yes others you want to to move from spiritual blindness to sight believe in jesus for who he is we must remember that jesus is our light and cling to his truth so that we are never blinded to god jesus is the light that can save us from from living a life estranged from him you know jesus question jesus question to this formerly blind man is the most important question that you can ever answer that blind man what was that question that jesus says do you believe in the son of man friends that question is a very important question do you believe in the son of man you must answer that question yes either now or at the judgment when it will be too late your eternal destiny hinges on answering that question rightly do you believe in the son of man you know ellen g white she has written one of the quotes this is a uh, taken from signs of the times signs of the times november 9 1893 what she writes she writes the pharisees were spiritually blind and were leaders of the blind the physical blindness that jesus had healed in the man born blind was not as dangerous as the moral blindness of those who had evidence piled upon evidence 
in regards to the divine character of the world's redeemer. And yet, who closed the eyes, who closed the eyes of their understanding and refused to see because they were self-exalted to be instructed by Christ. They claimed to be learned in the scriptures, to have spiritual eyesight. That's what they claimed. In short, those who reject Christ and his word are spiritually blind and they are lost. John 6, 68 and 69. To the spiritually blind individual, spiritual things are meaningless. Paul describes Satan as the cause of spiritual blindness. Satan is a cause of spiritual blindness. In his letter to the Corinthians, in their, uh, in their case, the God of this world, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. So, we come to an end. The story of Hagar is full of God's goodness. Her story reminds us that no matter who we are or where we are, the Lord God sees us and cares about us. He will comfort and provide for everyone who turns to him. And he will always keep his promise. Without the opening of our spiritual eyes, we walk in carnal blindness, unable to comprehend the good news of the gospel and what it means for our eternal salvation. So, as we pray for God's guidance in our everyday lives, let's not forget to ask him to keep our spiritual eyes open. The eyes of our hearts towards him. May God bless each one of you as you keep your spiritual eyes opened. It's only then you can see our Savior.